Guys, I'm down really bad. I don't know what to say. I messed up. So a couple of days ago, while I was doing my market analysis, which I love to provide to you every single time I can, I said this, the S&P 500 sitting at the 200 day moving average. What does this mean? Why I would not short here, even though there could be a bout of market weakness, some more market weakness. I said, although we could see some downside from here, I would not open you shorts here, meaning I wouldn't take out large shorts from this level. Now you'd think that that made sense because we were at 200 MA support. The head and shoulders that I've been calling out for months already played out. And I myself publicly on this channel gave you two opportunities to short since August. Go back and watch my videos. Now you think that that would be common sense. And although this video almost has a 99% like rate, I did get more hateful comments than usual. Why? Because the market had a couple of red days thereafter. Guys, that wasn't a day trading call out. I'm giving you my overall macro analysis and saying that there was an optimal time to short and it wasn't an optimal short from that level if you were going to open a large position for a long time. I'm not talking about day trades. Obviously, for those of you that are in the academy, you know this, or for those of you that are just even fans of this channel, you know this, we go short and long every day. We were short today, captured a great short by one of our analysts, over $2,000 per contract on NQ shorts. Now, I promise there's some value in this video and I will give you my analysis on the markets as we stand, especially considering upcoming economic events. And I will be doing a video over the weekend on the GDP breakdown, which came out 4.9% growth. They're lying, by the way. But if you don't believe that I've been consistent on my analysis, here's a video montage of me saying the same thing literally for two months. In September, it's worst month ever historically, both that and the NASDAQ. And that would be in line with my thesis that we will get at least a 5 to 10% drop. But I do think we will see more downside. And like I said, on the S&P 500, the ultimate goal will be if we can get to the 430 range would be nice, but really really, if we want to have a true buy the dip opportunity where we cannot wait to buy the dip, in my view, it'll be around the 405 to 415 range. You can see that we have a clear level between 405 and 415 for the SPY. I will be a heavy buyer on the SPY if we get to that level. This right here does not instill confidence that we are ready to move up beyond the head and shoulders. Also, if you measure from the head until the neckline, we're about 4.3%. So we expect there to be a similar drop from the neckline below if we are, as a matter of fact, going to confirm this head and shoulders in the classical sense. In my view, I do think the 10 year is going to 5% and I think that will cause one last capitulation down on the S&P 500. As I said before, I could be wrong. We already got near to the level I was addressing. I was looking for that 405 to 410 level on the S&P 500. So now that I've wasted your time with that, I just want to say, guys, I provide this because because I really love teaching. I love to give you my analysis, give you my take on the market. I promise you, if anything, that it's an honest take and you can see how consistent I've been. Now, my opinions can change. I can be wrong. But on this one thing, I've been consistent. And all I said was it wasn't optimal to open a large short at support. That's all I said. But I get it. Tensions are high. Half the people think that we are going to go to all time highs. Half the people think that we're going to crash to zero. Even when I drew that head and shoulders on the S&P 500, this one right here back in August, August and September, people were telling me, this is not a head and shoulders. Are you crazy? We're not going to drop. We're going back to all time highs. Don't you know what a head and shoulders looks like? Haven't you ever seen a technical analysis textbook? Yes, guys, I went to finance school. But at the end of the day, it's your choice. Don't trade off of videos. Certainly don't swing trade or day trade off of videos. That's why I provide macro analysis. I will never try to provide a day trade or a swing trade on a video because videos are very time sensitive. But I do try to provide an overall picture for the day trades, the swing trades. You guys know where to find me. All right, now that I've wasted your time, let's get straight to the analysis and I'll give you some of my plays at the end of the video. Thank you guys for sticking around and tolerating me. All right, guys, here's what we're looking at for the markets. As I said in that montage and all along, between 4,100 and 4,200 was my target to buy. That is around the 410 level on the SPY. We're getting near there now. Now, why is that my buy point? Well, it is very close to a 50% retracement of this entire rally from October, which I always buy. I always buy indices and I always buy blue chips when we get a 50% retracement of a previous rally. 
and I always buy stock market corrections. And as of now, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ have officially entered correction territory. A correction is defined by 10% to 20% drop and over 20% is considered a bear market. So I always buy corrections. Now, why is that? Well, I shared this with you before, but if you look at the gains following a bear market, following corrections, this one is specifically following bear markets. You can find one that's following corrections. But if you do your buying during corrections and bear markets, your gains are in the hundreds of percentage points, usually after a five year period. Now, for those people that just, you know, follow the method where they enter the market in once with a lump sum of money or dollar cost average, regardless of where the market is, that's fine too. History shows that that also bodes well in terms of returns. But those of you that can read a chart and that can buy bear markets and corrections, which it's not hard to read a chart, but most people, especially if you're a boomer or an older person, most people are not going to look at trading view. This is actually a very new phenomenon. So, you know, if you can read a chart and you can enter at minus 10% or minus 20%, even though I don't think we'll get to a bear market, you are doing yourself a favor. So that was my buy point for the S&P 500, as well as a few other blue chip stocks, which I'll talk about some of my moves towards the end of the video. So we are nearing that level now, and I'm starting to nibble on the S&P 500, but 405, I will definitely go even heavier. The NASDAQ for me is a little bit precarious, even though we are near a support level here on the daily, but the NASDAQ is a little bit more precarious to me because these are the only stocks that are really up. The Magnificent Seven have a much bigger weight in the NASDAQ than they do in the S&P 500. So, you know, I don't mind buying the NASDAQ either because it is in correction territory, but if I had to favor one over the other, for me personally, I would overweight the S&P more because I think it has many more beaten up stocks than the NASDAQ. So aside from the top stocks in the S&P 500, most S&P stocks are actually down right now. But this is in line with where I thought the market would go. Again, as my previous analysis would tell you for a few different reasons. One, the measure from the head to the neckline. If you just take that simple measurement below the neckline, you'll see that we are right around this level here, the 50% retracement point, and then also the volume profile. This shows you where the most volume is for a certain price point. And if you go all the way back to the highs, the highest point in the market in January 2022, you'll see that we are right at that level. This right here is called the point of control, this yellow line. This is where the most volume was since the all-time high for the S&P 500. So I will likely be a buyer at this level. Now, I will admit that the weekly on the NASDAQ does look a bit heavy. Like I said, it can find temporary support here, but the weekly on the NASDAQ can go to that 13.8, 13.9 level. Again, when you're dealing in these fringes, the big move has already been made. And you guys know that I sent out shorts twice on the S&P 500, broad base shorts. Now, when you're dealing in the fringes, and that was the whole point of my last video, when you're dealing in the fringes, it's very hard to say it's going to stop at 410. No, the spy is going to go to 405. No, it's going to go to 401. Now you're dealing in the fringes. And I did tell you that if this head and shoulders plays out, 440 can easily become 410. That broader move is easier to calculate. So I could definitely see the NASDAQ fall to that 13.8, 13.9 level. Obviously, we have Apple and NVIDIA earnings left. Those are going to be in November. Right now, this video is October 26th. And then we also have FOMC on November 1st. Now, on my Twitter, and make sure you're following me on both Twitter and Instagram, I post daily trading and finance content. So much value for free. Make sure you follow me on both those platforms. And oh yeah, we also shorted Meta for 32% on this vertical spread, right? So I'm very capable of doing short day trades and swing trades. <laughs> but I said uh, breaking, GDP grows at 4.9% annual pace in Q3. I will do a video about GDP. But the reason that this is important is because this now gives the Fed impetus, in my opinion, that the economy is strong, even though half of these numbers are lies. And I'll tell you why. Well, you could see here a summary of the reason why government spending is included in GDP. But jobless claims came in higher than expected. So the Fed will likely use the fact that jobless claims are higher than expected. So they're going to cite a softening labor market, which is what they want. But they're going to say, hey, the economy is, you know, the soft landing narrative is, is very well intact. So the economy is doing well and labor is going up. So we're just going to hold rates here and not raise them on November 1st. That's what I think is going to happen. Now, the reason they're doing that, the reason that they would hold is because they're terrified of the havoc that yields are going to cause on the economy. These rising yields are out of control. You've seen Rick Santelli go on CNBC talking about the 10-year 
can hit 13 or 14 percent. So if the Fed keeps raising rates, yields are going to continue going up. Now, not only is that bad for stocks, bad for businesses, bad for the economy, bad for people trying to borrow, but it's also bad for the government. As rates go up, U.S. payments, their interest payments on debts go haywire. Right now, the United States Treasury owes about $659 billion on the debt, which has doubled in two years. So this can't continue to go up because then it becomes just like a, it is a Ponzi scheme, but it becomes a vicious cycle. The interest payments go up. So the Fed needs more money. So they issue more treasuries. The more they flood the market with treasuries, the price of treasuries goes down, right? Because you oversupply the market with treasuries. The price of treasuries goes down means the yields go up even more, means now they owe more money. So it's an entire mess that we've created. So I think what the Fed is going to do is they're going to hold. And you could see here November 1st, 96% chance that the Fed actually holds and does not raise. There's actually a 3.8% chance that they cut. This is new. This is insane that some people, a very small percentage, albeit, are betting that the Fed is actually going to cut because of what I was talking about. They also need these yield curves to uninvert, which they are very close to doing. So they need the short end of the curve. They need these short end bonds, the one month, two month, three month, four month, six month, two year, and three year. They need all of these to be below the 10 year. Currently, they're all above the 10 year. That's why we have inverted yield curve. So if the Fed continues to raise rates, the short term rates are going to be affected the most. This is why they're high. So they need these short term rates to fall in relation to the long term rates. And they need this to uninvert for a healthy bond market and a healthy credit market as well. Now, I believe that is priced in to the market. Obviously, it's right here. I believe that it's it's somewhat priced into the market. So obviously what Jerome Powell says again is going to be important. That's November 1st. We will be live streaming it here. So I do think that the NASDAQ does have a little bit more to drop. I do think it can drop to that 13.8, 13.9 level on the NASDAQ. On QQQ, that's around 338. Again, we're dealing in the fringes. So take this with a grain of salt. As I stated before, a broad base short from here is not optimal. You are literally shorting from most of the move has already been taken. You're literally shorting from either support or even if you're shorting from halfway, it's not an optimal new short. That does not mean do not day trade. We day trade every single day. And I am buyer of the S&P from that 405 to 410 range, as I've stated for two months now. Now, I've also said that October, we have seen capitulation events, not every October, but when things look a little awry like they do now in terms of the yield, in terms of the credit markets, et cetera, there have been capitulation events in October and November, December are two of the best months in the stock market. So, you know, would I be surprised if there's an event where the VIX pops to 25 or 30 and the the market endures one last blow? No, it would not surprise me, but um, I can't predict these fringe events, right? I can only deal with sound analysis. And as I stated in my last video, I do think there is room in a portfolio at the moment for either bond ETFs or bonds in general. Apple corporate bonds are paying 6%. You have bond ETFs like TLT or AGG. I do think that there is room for starting to nibble on these bond ETFs. I do think that rates will go up a little bit more before we get a recession next year. I do think we will get a recession in 2024 just based on all of the traditional markers. Also, I do think that if the Fed is serious about unwinding their balance sheet, and they, it looks like they have been, I have to give the Fed credit for this. Over a trillion dollars has been wiped out off of the Fed's balance sheet since they started quantitative tightening. Now, are they serious enough to drop this back to pre-pandemic levels at around 3.8 trillion? I hope so, because they weren't serious enough to drop it after the great financial crisis when they barely had any money on their balance sheet. They had less than a trillion dollars on their balance sheet. After the great financial crisis, they started experimenting with quantitative easing, took it up to 2.25 trillion. Trillion. And then in 2013, they're like, I don't know if it was, you know, basically politicians calling their desks and money managers and all the connections saying, oh my God, this free money is amazing. Inject more liquidity into the market. From 2013 onwards, we also did have a market scare around that time, but not enough to justify an additional $2 trillion in assets. And then obviously the pandemic happened and they doubled the assets on their balance sheet. So if they're serious about bringing this down, that is 
likely going to be a very painful cycle because we've never had quantitative easing before. I've gone over it on this channel. Quantitative easing is something that they created after the great financial crisis. It created so much liquidity in the markets, in the economy, you know, basically during Obama's years from 2008 all the way until 2016 and then through Trump's presidency until 2020. That was the age of easy money between 2008 and 2020. All the growth that we've seen, most of it can be attributed to that. And so we were dealing in a zero interest rate environment with so much liquidity that unwinding that has to be a complicated process, right? If we've never done that before and dropping rates to zero while injecting this much liquidity in the market really gave the market a boost of epic proportions. Well, what do you think unwinding it looks like? So if the Fed is serious about unwinding this, then yeah, I think we're in a world of pain. What I think will happen, because I'm cynical and I've seen how the Fed works and they haven't rolled off any, really seriously, they haven't rolled off assets off of their balance sheet since 2008. And now they're rolling off a trillion. Looks okay. What happens when they take this down another trillion or two or three or four like they're supposed to? So I'm not going to sit here now in October, November 2023 and pretend like if we get a recession, I'll know the extent of it because I don't know that the Fed is actually going to stick to its plans of rolling all those assets off their balance sheet. I think they will panic and I think we'll go back to some sort of easing in no time. And I don't think the full effect of the recession is going to play out the way that it would naturally play out. Anyway, traders, that is it for this video. I am gearing up to make a few more long-term buys. Might also do some poor man cover calls. Definitely selling cash secure puts. If you want access to all of our day trades, swing trades, long-term trades, cover calls, poor man's cover calls, cash secure puts, all the strategies that we utilize. I even talk about treasuries in there. I even talk about mutual funds. All of the strategies that we utilize in order to maximize our monetary gain. Come join us. Click the link in the description for 50% off your first three months. You cannot beat that deal. That is literally a little over $2 a day. And we are dishing out futures day trades worth hundreds, sometimes even thousands every single day. So click the link in the description. If you want to join Mastermind 3.0, which starts in November, get your name on the wait list. That link is also in the description. Hope you liked the video. If you did, give it a big fat thumbs up. Let me know in the comment section if you liked the video and what types of videos you would like to see next. Would you like day trades? videos? You know, would you like me to continue making broad-based market overviews? Would you like me to keep making videos telling you when it's an optimal time not to short? Let me know in the comment section below. I try to read every single comment. Appreciate you tuning in. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. Stay safe out there, traders. Peace.